Grace and peace. Welcome to Judas Roar Domestic Violence Awareness Initiative YouTube channel. I am your host, Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson. We're excited to have you with us today. We are committed to igniting hearts, inspiring minds, and safeguarding destinies. Now, I'm going to give you a few minutes to subscribe if you've not done so already. Check right down here. If you're interested in partnering with us, uh, being a support to us, joining arms with us as we continue our quest to raise awareness and to stop domestic violence. You can find all of our contact information in the description box below this video. So I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to subscribe if you've not done so already. Feel free to share even while you're viewing the video. Feel free to comment as well. All right. We have several points that we want to make. Uh, things that we want to bring to your attention uh, so that as you navigate your journey um, in a relationship that's been impacted by domestic violence, that you are sensitive to what to look for, um, uh, to indicate that the abuser is not changing. And so oftentimes we get this question, you know, is it possible for an abuser to change? Well, nothing's impossible. Um, it's highly unlikely that they will change. Um, and the thing that you have to weigh in the balance is um, how intense has the abuse been? Um, how much escalation has occurred? And are you literally taking your life into your hands by assuming a hopeful position? And so it's important that we know what to look for. It's also important to understand that if you've been experiencing trauma, that your brain has been rewired. And so therefore your ability to discern um, and to reason has been impacted by the abuse that you have experienced. And this is the case, even if the abuse has not escalated to a place where it includes physical aggression or sexual assault. All right, let's look at those signs. Indicator number one, Here's a question. Is the victim being pressured or manipulated into dropping charges or the order of protection? Is the victim being pressured or manipulated into dropping charges, criminal charges, or the order of protection? And so oftentimes what we call hoovering, hoovering will take place where the abuser attempts to suck the victim back in. Often this occurs once they've been incarcerated, while they're still behind bars, um, if they've bonded out, once they've been released, um, and it can take many, many, many different forms. And so one example of hoovering would be, I'm sorry, can we try again? Um, maybe presenting the victim with all the things that the victim has always wanted to receive in the relationship that the abuser has refused to provide whether that is financial support, whether that is uh, physical nurturing, um, holding hands, um, kissing, uh, gifts, acknowledging accomplishments that the victim may have made. And, and maybe in the past, these things have been ignored, right? But if the abuser is in hoovering mode, then the manipulation will kick in and that can be the form of threats threats of violence, threats of aggression, threats of suicide, harming themselves, harming loved ones, or it can take the place of, uh, it can present like this pitiful, sorrowful, woebegone thing, right? Where they're really, really sad and they really, really love you and they really need for you to just drop the charges or to violate the order of protection or fail to show up in court, right? Which may make everything go away, depending on what the state's attorney is saying. Um, or going to court and declaring that you exaggerated, that you overreacted, that you were partially responsible or that you were fully responsible for the abuse that you have um, encountered. And so question number one, is the victim being pressured or manipulated into dropping charges or the order of protection. So here's the thing, here's the thing. If the abuser's spending time around you and there's no question 
There's no pressure, there's no suggestion, there's no inference that charges should be dropped or that an order of protection should be dropped, okay? Then maybe you can be hopeful. But nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, for some abusers, this happens early on in the reconnection. For others, they bide their time, they wait, they wait, they wait. They offer the victim what the victim's always wanted, but has always been refused. And then they launch the question or they make the demand, okay? And so when this happens, they're not changing, okay? Question number two, does the victim have to remind or encourage the abuser to keep their intervention appointments or to complete their programming, to attend their group meetings or to attend their counseling services? So maybe in the past, the abuser has refused counseling, declared and decreed that there's nothing wrong with them, that you're the problem, right? And has refused to go to counseling. But now, but now, now, now they're willing to go, okay? And often this is, this is also a part of the, 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 the hoovering. This is a tool that's used in hoovering often, okay? But if you have to remind them about their own appointment, if you have to encourage them to go to these appointments, it's an indication that they're not truly committed to the process themselves. They are going because the court has ordered them to. They are going to buy time with the victim to uh, allow more time to go into that hoovering toolbox and suck the victim back in, right? And so again, the fact that they made the appointment with the counselor, the fact that they were incarcerated and maybe a, a, you know, a, a requirement for their bond or a requirement for their freedom was that they attend X number of classes to avoid incarceration. They'll sign up for that to buy time. It buys time for them to convince the victim that they're mistaken, that they shouldn't press charges, that things can be better, all right? And so understand that what abusers struggle with first and foremost, aside from the whole insatiable need for power and control, complete power and control, what they struggle with is accepting responsibility and being truly held accountable for their choice to abuse their partner, okay? All right, question number three. Is the victim being pressured to reestablish the relationship or to live with the abuser? And so let's say there's been domestic violence. It's been serious enough and ongoing enough for a separation to occur. Is the victim being pressured to reestablish the relationship if the relationship has been broken off? Is there pressure being applied to move back in or to allow the abuser to move back in? with the victim. If this is occurring, the abuser, whether they be male or female, is not changing. They're not changing. They haven't changed. They have not changed. The idea that pressure can be applied to reestablish a relationship, that manipulation can be utilized to reestablish a relationship is a flagrant violation of a boundary that's been established either legally because of order of protection or personally because the victim has said, I no longer want to be involved in this relationship, this is unhealthy. And so when pressure is received in spite of that, it's a flagrant, flagrant disregard for a boundary that's been established, which is disrespectful. Okay. All right. Question number four, is the abuser pressuring the victim to go to counseling for him or herself? It'll sound something like this. You know, you've had issues your entire life. You told me. And I think that that's part of the reason why we've been having so many problems. And when you act out on these things that you've experienced as a child, it's upsetting to me, right? But I think that if you go to counseling 
and, and work on your problems, then I wouldn't get upset and behave the way that I do. Okay, you see what you see what they did with that? So at the end of that whole conversation, it's the victim's fault because the victim is damaged. And now, now listen, the victim may or may not have issues, but that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is that abuse is taking place in the relationship. And if the one who was meeting out the abuse is sidestepping responsibility for how they choose to behave and how they choose to treat their partner, then the abuse continues even with that action. Okay? So our first four questions, is the victim being pressured or manipulated into dropping charges or dropping or violating an order of protection? Question number two, does the victim have to remind or encourage the abuser to keep their appointments and to complete their programming in regards to batterer intervention or counseling or anger management? Number three, is the victim being pressured to reestablish the relationship or to live with the abuser? Question number four, is the abuser pressuring the victim to go to counseling for him or herself? Because you know, because they have issues too. Okay. All right. Let's see what some other indicators are. Okay, moving on. Question number five. Does the abuser insist that they both attend couples counseling? Does the abuser insist, suggest, infer, try to manipulate the victim into working this out together? Because together you can accomplish anything, right? And we should go to couples counseling. This, for the record, in my professional opinion, as a clinician, as a career mental health professional, as an apostle in the Lord's church, is a horrible idea. It's a horrible idea, all right? It may look something like, well, you know, you asked me about going to counseling before, right? And, and you know, I was kind of hard-headed and I wouldn't agree to it. I, I, you know, I said no. You know, I was being prideful, uh, but but I'm a changed person. I'm a changed person. Um, and I think that I should consider what you want as well. And um, I think you were right. I think we should go to counseling together. Don't you fall for that. It's a big old trap with your name on it. Okay. Don't you fall for that. That's a horrible idea. And a seasoned clinician if they understand that there is domestic violence occurring in a relationship, will not conduct couples counseling. They will not. If you are seeing a therapist who knows that domestic violence is taking place in your relationship and they suggest couples counseling, you need a, a different therapist. I'm not taking it back. Don't do that. That's very, very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Okay, um, and it's an incredible, you know, it's an incredibly effective form of a manipulation that the abuser has in their coercive control toolbox. Okay, and so, especially if this is something that you desired to do before, before things got so bad, or when you began to see that that you all may not be seeing things eye to eye. But I'm telling you that once things progress to a point where domestic violence is taking place, and this is in, in, in the absence even of physical aggression or sexual assault, then couples counseling is contraindicated. Okay? Here's another question. Does the abuser tell the victim, you owe me another chance? You owe me another chance. You were in a rough place in your life when we met. I put it with all kinds of things. I have supported you. I have encouraged you. I have spent money on you. I have invested in you and I have believed in you. You owe me another chance. You owe me another chance. 
And so understand this, understand this, that abusers have an innate mindset of entitlement. Entitlement, the world owes them. The world owes them, okay? And this is what they believe. They firmly believe this. And so when they tell you that you owe them another chance or they do things, they remind you of what they've done for you. They remind you of the hard times that you've had and they were there for you. That entitlement is kicking in and they believe in their heart of hearts, what they're saying to you, that you owe them another chance. If the abuser is telling the victim, you owe me another chance, that is an indication that manipulation is taking place. And they, in fact, have not changed. All right. Now, this can take a number of different forms. It can be a tearful, pleading tone, or it can be a loud, angry tone with threats woven throughout. Okay. But when the dust settles, you're made to feel like you owe the abuser another chance. All right. Question number seven. Does the abuser say that he or she wants to change? They really desire to change. In their heart of hearts, they want to change. But, but they need the victim support to do it. I want to change. I know that the things that I've done is wrong. I, I wasn't raised that way. I don't know what's gotten into me. I think it's the drugs. I think it's the alcohol. I think it's the fact that my father left when I was two. I think it's because I never knew my mother. I think it's because I was in foster care. I was dropped on my head at birth. I've had this horrible, horrible childhood. I was neglected all my life. I've been misunderstood all my life, right? And so it's not my fault. I recognize now you've been trying to help me. And I recognize now that I need to change, but, but, but I can't do it without your support. If this is their conversation, whether it's presented in a pleading, conciliatory tone, or whether it's delivered with great angst and anger and threats, woven throughout, they have not changed, okay? All right, this, this, this form of manipulation is so egregious in my opinion because it will cause the victim, if they buy into it, to, to accept responsibility for the abuser's choices. The inference is, if you don't help me, then I will fail, and then my failure to change will be your fault. I'm being honest, and I'm acknowledging that I can't do it alone. Beloved, listen to me. It's important for you to understand this. You, as the victim, cannot help them. You don't have enough leverage. They don't ascribe enough importance to you for you to be the voice that they listen to. They've already established that you have no voice. And so if they can be helped, it won't be through you. And for you to attempt to do so means you're falling victim again to the coercive control tactics. And in many cases, jeopardizing your actual physical life and or your emotional, psychological, spiritual health, okay? So let's continue, let's continue. I know that this might be really hard to hear, you know, but as, as I stated at the beginning of this video, we are committed to igniting hearts, inspiring minds and safeguarding destinies. And the only way that we can do that is to be frank with you about the inner workings of domestic violence and how these things are all connected, okay? And how victims find themselves going through this cycle repeatedly um, often because they don't understand what to look for, all right? Okay, so here's question number eight. Does the abuser accuse the victim of being abusive? Does the abuser accuse the victim, right, of being 
abusive. Now, this is tricky. Why is this tricky? This is tricky because there are times when in an attempt to defend themselves, in an attempt to hold on to some semblance of having a voice or a relationship, in an attempt to protect their, their life or their physical health or their children or their pets, that a victim may respond in a manner that could be termed abusive. But for the abuser, the primary aggressor, the primary abuser, the one who started the whole thing, maybe not in that discreet instance, but who started down this road in the relationship way back there somewhere, to bring this up is in itself a form of abuse, okay? And so often the abuser will recount instances in which the victim's response to ongoing abuse right? The victim's response, if I'm the victim, right, and I'm just fed up and I just, I cannot take any more, my response to either that instance or to all of the instances that preceded it may even violate my own core values. I may find myself saying and doing things that I don't even approve of. I may find myself saying and doing things that disgust me, that violate everything that I know and believe to be right, that violate all the rules that I try to live my life by. And so what happens, right, when a victim reaches that saturation point and they can't take anymore and they say something or do something that they don't even approve of, the abuser will capture that moment and bring it up repeatedly um, in an attempt to further diminish that victim's sense of self and sense of positive self-regard. Okay, so what am I saying? I'm saying don't allow the fact that you responded negatively in ways that you don't even approve of. Don't allow that to cause you to believe that you deserve to be mistreated because that is not true. Okay, question number nine. Is the abuser minimizing the extent of the abuse that they are meeting out to their partner? Whenever they talk about it, in the rare instances where they acknowledge that anything happened at all, because many abusers will try to convince you that nothing happened, that you imagine the whole entire thing and that you need mental health counseling okay, because you have issues. But in those instances where they acknowledge that something has occurred, do they minimize it? Do they deny that it occurred at all? Or do they say things like, oh, that was just a little push. I didn't hit you that hard. Well, I didn't hit you with a closed fist. So I don't know what you're upset about. I just, I just pushed you a little bit. I was just holding your arms to try to keep you from hitting me. I just pushed you so I could get out of the door. Are they minimizing the damage that has occurred? Are they minimizing the intensity of their behavior? Because if they are, if they are, they have not changed, okay? Again, I know this is hard to hear. I know this is hard to hear, but we're trying to, we're trying to keep you alive, okay? Question number 10, does the abuser try to get the victim to feel sorry for them? To feel sorry for them. You know, I've worked all my life to try to have this, this, this job. I've got this job and, 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 and this position and, and I'm well-respected at the church. And, and, you know, maybe I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor and people look up to me and they think I'm amazing. And so if you go forward with these charges, right? If you tell anybody what's happening, you know, I'm human too. If you tell anybody, then, then it will ruin me. It will ruin us. It'll ruin us because I'm doing all of this for us. Okay. People of faith struggle with this often. People who pride themselves on being empathic, right? Because that's a thing right now, being empathic, uh, 
being able to put yourself in another person's position and, you know, being full of compassion and, and, and a myriad of misappropriated scriptures are often invoked also. Um, but really, this is all gaslighting. This is all gaslighting. And again, this is the abuser wiggling out of accepting responsibility for decisions that they have made to harm someone that they say they care about. Okay, question number 11. Does the abuser try to get close friends, relatives, your pastor, your bishop, your apostle, or even your own children to feel sorry for them? You know, I've been working really, really hard on our relationship and it just seems like I, I can't get it right. And, and I know that from time to time I might overreact. And, but, you know, they trigger me. They say things that, you know, they know they shouldn't say or they come home late or they burnt the eggs or I don't know. I just I just had a bad day at work and I came home and I just it was all displaced and, and, I, and I took it out on them. Um, or they'll say, you know, the victim has issues, right? They've struggled with being depressed and being anxious, overreacting, all these things. Now, listen, these things, there may be a, a kernel of truth in it, or it could be a blatant, full-fledged lie designed to set the stage so that as abuse escalates, it's clear, it's clear to these relatives, it's clear to these mutual friends, it's clear to the bishop, to the pastor, whoever, that the victim is the problem. Okay? All right. And so what, what does this mean? This means that they work on converting those around them to flying monkeys. They will weaponize the victim's friends, relatives, ministry leaders, employers, the police, against the victim, okay? Again, I know this is hard to hear, but if you're gonna maintain your personal safety, if you're gonna be able to help a loved one to maintain their own personal safety, then you, you need to be able to recognize what indicators are there to let you know, to let you know that the abuser is either changing or not changing. And so in this video, we are highlighting the things that are clear indicators that the abuser is not changing. Last, but certainly not least, does the abuser attend faithfully or not so much counseling or batterers intervention programming or anger management classes and then weaponize what they have used right, in these classes or in these counseling sessions against the victim? Do they come to the victim and say, well, you know, I've been attending those classes that you wanted me to attend, or that the judge made me attend, or that the police made me attend, and um, I learned, I learned that, that you're the problem. I learned X, Y, and Z. I learned that both parties must be uh, have issues or challenges in order for the relationship to end up the way ours has? Do they, do they come home and they take the facts that they've learned and apply them to the victim? Are they using what they have learned to further manipulate the victim and to establish power and control over the victim? These are all very important questions, important questions. And so we've outlined 12 different things that you can look at if they appear in the relationship. And I'm telling you, if the abuser has not changed, one of these things is very likely to pop up in the relationship, okay? And so it's important that even when it does, that you acknowledge that it's an indicator that change is not taking place. The most important thing, the most important thing is the safety of the victim and the victim's loved ones and the victim's pets, their emotional 
and physical and spiritual well-being and that they stay alive so that they can fulfill their destiny. Understand if you are a victim that your purpose in life is not wrapped up in attempting to change another human being or to love them to a place of healing, okay? You put yourself in a place of, 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 of harm. You place yourself in harm's way if you view it that way. Understand that domestic violence escalates by nature, that it is rooted in an insatiable need, desire that the abuser has for complete power and control. They're not happy with some power and some control. They're not satisfied in a relationship where mutuality, mutual respect, mutual positive regard are the underpinnings. What they need, what they need to feel alive is to completely control another human being. We've been talking about indicators that an abuser has not changed. I am Apostle Cheryl L. Richardson with Judas Roar Domestic Violence Awareness Initiative. It is my prayer that this video will help you to navigate more safely your journey out of domestic violence. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there. Blessings to you.